right. <laughs> okay, we are, we are live and on YouTube. Good morning. Uh, this is uh, the House Health Care Committee, and it's Thursday, January 28th. Uh, before we get started with our witnesses this morning, we have a couple brief introductions. Uh, a number of our committee members have uh, students uh, working with them as interns, and we're wanting to just give them an opportunity to introduce them to the committee and to others uh, before we get started. So I'll start with uh, Representative Donahue and then Representative Goldman. I think you each have an intern to introduce. Yeah, thank you very much. I've been working for the past month and looking forward to the rest of the session with uh, Rachel Best from UVM. And I'll give her a minute to uh, tell us where she's from and, and what you're uh, uh, studying in school and all that sort of brief intro. Yeah, just briefly. Hi, um, I'm Rachel. I'm a junior at the University of Vermont studying political science and I'm also minoring in history and health and society. And I'm very excited to be working for the Vermont State Legislator. It's all very exciting to me and I am originally from Westchester, New York, but yeah, I'm loving Vermont and everything. So yeah, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> Good, well, welcome, and welcome to your work with Representative Donahue and the House Health Care Committee. And Representative Goldman. So I have the pleasure of introducing Alexis Drown, also a UVM student, um, 24 grad. Um, she's been doing great work supporting me, particularly technologically, which has been a great challenge, um, and doing research as well. So Alexis, a brief introduction. Yeah, um, this has been super exciting getting to work with uh, Representative Goldman. I am from UVM. I graduate 24. I'm a freshman. I'm majoring in both psychology and political science with a minor in Spanish. I'm from Vermont. I'm from Milton, Vermont, which is only like 30 minutes away. I'm assuming you all know. Um, yeah, this has been a super interesting experience. I'm excited to kind of get some hands on political science work. So, yeah. Well. Thank this you. A great, place. Yeah, great place for you to be and yeah. welcome. Um, and an unusual way to begin, but with uh, joining the Zoom legislature, the uh, 19 or 2019, 2021 legislature. Uh, so with that, I'm going to ask, uh, welcome interns, but I'm going to ask you to go off video screen, if you would, please, because it's easier for me as the chair to track who's um, who's in the meeting and who has questions, et cetera. We're going to um, begin this morning. We're going to continue uh, our uh, testimony about the all payer model. And we'll get the name right shortly. It's a lot longer than that. But um, uh, yesterday we were hearing, we heard both from the Green Mountain Care Board about their work generally uh, and then also from Ina Backus, who gave us a, uh, an overview of a good deal of, of the history of Vermont healthcare reform. Uh, and I would recommend those if, if for our interns, for your interns, if you hadn't had a chance to uh, be with us yesterday, you might wanna go back and now you can, on YouTube, you can watch uh, Ina's presentation. It was, um, it, was, it was very useful to, I think, to have us have that background. Um, so today we, we cut Ina's presentation short a little bit, but we're gonna start with uh, Ina, who is the Director of Healthcare Reform for the state of Vermont to uh, com complete her testimony around the all payer model. Then we'll, we will take a break uh, and we will then hear from um, Elena Barabee from the Green Mountain Care Board about their role and, and the all payer model and take another break and then we'll come back and Ina will continue to review with us uh, some of the work that the Agency of Human Services has undertaken in also reviewing and which some refer to as the reboot uh, issues around uh, the all payer model. So with that, I think I'm gonna to turn to Colleen just to make sure I'm not forgetting something else that I should be doing before we go hearing from our witnesses. But I think, I think we're good. I think you're good. Okay, so again, good morning and welcome. Uh, I'm going to turn, oh, and for committee members, uh, 
Elizabeth will be joining us. Uh, Elizabeth Burroughs, she had a family uh, errand uh, that was necessary and she let me know. She'll join us shortly. And I believe Representative Cordes is going to run down the hall to natural resources <laughs> at some point this morning to present a bill, but we'll go and be back. Uh, yes, just don't run too fast and we'll look for your return. <laughs> Okay, so with that, let's turn to Rep let's turn to Ina Bacchus uh, from the Agency of Human Services, Director of Healthcare Reform. And again, probably just for the purposes, if you just you know just briefly introduce yourself or quote our Zoom record. Good morning. For the record, my name is Ina Bacchus. I am the Director of Healthcare Reform at the Agency of Human Services. Thank you for having me back today. I will share my screen again. <clears throat> Hopefully you can all easily see. As can, can I, I apologize. I apologize, you know, I, I failed to introduce uh, Sarah Berry from okay. OneCare, who is also on the screen with us this morning. Uh, perhaps we could go uh, just so people could uh, have Sarah introduce herself. My I'll apologies. stop sharing in a moment. Yeah. Good morning, I'm Sarah Berry. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for OneCare Vermont. Thank you for having me this morning. Great, thank you. Thank you for joining us. I appreciate you being here. Okay, let's let's continue then. Thank you, and thank you for the reminder, Colleen. Oops. It's it's really nice to have the opportunity to follow up uh, the next day with the committee um, to to continue our our conversation about healthcare reform at uh, the different problems that our healthcare system confronts and the different ways that we can address those problems uh, through reform initiatives. Um, so thank you. Yesterday we talked about the, um, the problems that our system is confronting. One of those problems that I believe we all appreciate is the rate of cost growth in our healthcare system. And I think we also can appreciate that the quality and experience of care in certain instances for persons that are experiencing and utilizing uh, healthcare services across the care continuum can be improved. And certainly outcomes for Vermonters can be improved too. With respect to addressing healthcare spending growth, we talked yesterday also about the per predominant way that the healthcare system has been reimbursed for healthcare services in the United States. It remains the predominant uh, reimbursement methodology for the healthcare system. However, there is emphasis, um, bipartisan mm -hmm. emphasis, federal and state and health policy leaders um, emphasizing that if we could move away from a fee for service reimbursement system where each and every service that is delivered is, is um, paid for regardless of the, of the quality or the outcomes um, that, that we may be better positioned to both control the rate of growth in healthcare spending as well as to improve the quality of care um, that is delivered and the and the uh, complement of services delivered to most appropriately need, meet the needs um, of, of both of Vermonters and, and any, anyone seeking care, um, as well as to do so uh, in a more efficient, in a more efficient way. And so through the all payer model agreement and which is our state and federal agreement, which I'll, I'll, I'll delve into more in the next slide. Um, we are able 
to move towards setting a budget for the healthcare system that is participating in this model instead of paying for each and every service uh, performed regardless of the outcome. And, and clearly tying that budget with a measurement framework and an accountability framework to the quality of care uh, and ultimately improved health outcomes for Vermonters. We call this reform initiative, Vermont's All Payer Accountable Care Organization Model Agreement. The agreement that we have to pay differently is, is one where each major payer group uh, that covers Vermonters in our state, um, Medicare covering older Vermonters, Medicaid covering uh, traditionally low-income Vermonters, and commercial insurance uh, covering uh, Vermonters who are employed, Vermonters self-employed, Vermonters who are individually purchasing uh, commercial insurance coverage. Uh, this agreement in place allows for those major payer groups who are participating to specifically pay an accountable care organization differently than the traditional fee-for-service reimbursement uh, methodology. And the agreement uh, brings Medicare into the space of paying differently in Vermont um, in alignment with the other major payer groups. Without an agreement of this kind, Medicare would continue to pay fee-for-service um, in Vermont, just as it does uh, predominantly in, in every other state and has done for a very long time. And I'll emphasize again um, that Medicare um, in, in this model agreement, and, and we'll talk after, after, um, after I, I review again what the model agreement is as I'm doing now, Elena is gonna dive more deeply into the responsibilities that the Green Mountain Care Board has for monitoring uh, in the agreement and for um, doing some regulation in this agreement. Um, and then I'll come back to the implementation improvement plan where we have um, we have put forth recommendations for how we can perform better in the agreement. And I'll say that moving our Medicare payer partner more aggressively away from fee for service is uh, very much a recommendation that we put forth and that we are working towards. However, I think it's very important to acknowledge that Vermont um, and the way that Medicare is paying our ACO differently is today, even though it's not as differently as we would like to see, um, is really a, a, a major step in the right direction. And <clears throat> excuse me, Medicare is only paying this way uh, in, in one other state in the whole United States uh, to one other ACO. So it, re it really is, uh, a innovative model with Medicare participating, even though we have a lot that we've learned from how our Medicaid program is operating, and even though we can do better, I don't want to um, underemphasize that we are innovating with our federal partner today. <clears throat> the agreement that Vermont has with the federal government holds the state accountable for curbing healthcare cost growth and improving uh, quality of care, population health outcomes. And Vermont is also accountable in this agreement for um, ensuring that the participation in the model reaches a scale over time and that it is a truly statewide model. The Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation was very interested in working with Vermont to apply a model that could be statewide and consistent across our, our population, um, not only for the consistency with the an alignment of the changed incentives, uh, but also to demonstrate um, that there can be a consistent approach for, <clears throat> excuse me, for a state. The, the agreement, uh, 
as Chair Lippert noted, it has a long title. The, the long title of the agreement is the Vermont All Payer Accountable Care Organization Model Agreement. And I frequently come back to that title when I think about the key element of element and elements of, of our, our federal state partnership. And it certainly um, is a very central element uh, is that the accountable care organization is the entity um, or entities that can accept through this agreement, the, the alternative um, to fee for service payment. Accountable care organizations are a network of providers uh, who are accountable for the cost and quality of care uh, for a defined population. There are a couple of key opportunities with accountable care organizations um, that are beneficial when paying differently. The first of course is we, we are aiming for more integrated <clears throat> care across the care continuum in our state. We, we have a goal um, for there to be a seamless delivery of care across the variety of settings where Vermonters uh, need and want to receive services. And with an accountable care organization, that creates a, a organizing influence and a formal network of diverse providers that are actually choosing and agreeing that they are working together to be accountable for the care and quality of a defined population. So in of itself, an accountable care organization is a vehicle for care coordination and integration of different services. Additionally, the accountable care organization um, allows providers um, to, to share in any savings um, together that they may achieve through offering care in this different manner, through better coordination um, and, and through innovating and transforming the delivery of care for their patients. So again, our model, um, our model invites alternative payment methodologies. So alternatives to fee for service and, and it includes Medicare in paying differently and that different payment is, is directed at an accountable care organization. Um, the agreement is agnostic to how many accountable care organizations uh, could participate. In Vermont, we have one active accountable care organization, which is One Care Vermont. And you will hear more from, from them uh, if you haven't already. Yeah, no. um, you will hear more from One Care Vermont about who they are and, and, and what they do. Um, but they are a, a key partner in this agreement, um, not a signatory to the agreement, but a key partner in implementing the agreement because they are the uh, single accountable care organization in Vermont. We have an agreement with CMS. ACOs and payers choose to work together to, um, to participate in the agreement, first of all, and, and then uh, work together to develop agreements within that network of providers. And then that network of providers, um, uh, the ACOs and the providers who want to work together then develop provider-led agreements um, between the ACO and, the, and, the, and its participants. Our agreement has uh, key targets for annual growth uh, and, and at the end of the agreement, which is four, excuse me, five performance years. We are in performance year four now. Um, the, the target growth rate is that healthcare spending in Vermont for the services that are included in the, in the agreement. And that is, that's, a, that's another um, place where we can we can elaborate further. Those services are roughly equivalent to um, those services that Medicare covers in its physician and hospital program. Not all services are subject to the total cost of care target for spending. Um, some key examples of services that are not subject to that target uh, are pharmacy services. Um, pharmacy is not subject, pharmacy spending is not subject to this to this agreement target. 
the, the target is 3.5% uh, up to 4.3%. Medicare has a separate growth target because Medicare is participating in this agreement and also Medicare wants to see healthcare spending growth uh, uh, moderate in our state. They also want to test whether um, by moderating through this model in the state of Vermont, they can apply this model more broadly within the United States. The Medicare growth target is uh, 0.2 percentage points below national projections. The agreement requires that there be alignment of payer programs across the participating payers. And the agreement requires that there, again, is a scale of participation um, that is the preponderance of the Vermont population be included in fee-for-service alternative payment models that are qualifying ACO scale target initiatives through this agreement. We also commit in the agreement to improve access to primary care, to reduce deaths due to suicide and drug overdose, and to reduce the prevalence and morbidity of chronic disease. I'll take a moment to describe, I, I referenced the key partners in implementing this agreement. There are three signatories to the all payer model agreement from the state of Vermont. And the agreement is something that the state of Vermont uh, uh, signs on to with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, which is a part of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS. The Green Mountain Care Board, and, and you'll hear very soon now from Elena, and so I won't spend long here because she will describe to you the Green Mountain Care Board's particular role in the agreement. But the Green Mountain Care Board is a key uh, signatory, both signatory and uh, holds a lot of responsibility in this agreement for monitoring, reporting to CMMI, and regulation of the system within the agreement. The Vermont Agency of Human Services is also a signatory along with the governor um, and the Agency of Human Services as a part of the administration is responsible uh, through the agreement and, and is required to offer a Medicare program of alternative payment that is consistent with the terms of the agreement uh, and meets, meets the requirement for the alternative payment model within the agreement. And, and, and the agency is responsible for reporting to CMMI specifically regarding uh, how in a future agreement, additional services across the care continuum could potentially be integrated into the uh, targets for cost growth moderation. Um, that is something that is not, um, I wanna be very clear, we, we have the duty to propose uh, a potential uh, model in this in this way, it does not mean that we uh, necessarily are required uh, to incorporate these these services into a financial target. Um, we do have to explore and, and and make a proposal for what would be appropriate um, if 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 any inclusion is appropriate. The accountable care organization. And in Vermont, again, we have one accountable care organization, One Care Vermont, in, in as being a partner in this agreement is responsible for contracting with payers um, in these alternative fee-for-service models and working with its provider network to uh, perform in this alternative payment model and to do so by implementing delivery system changes uh, that would, would uh, to help, help its network to deliver care more efficiently and to improve the quality of care delivered. And thereby, uh, we, we hope to see controlled cost, at cost growth and moderation. And finally, private insurers in Vermont also are key partners in the implementation of this agreement. Uh, the private payer, needs to have a contract with the ACO uh, to provide for this alternative payment. And, those, and, and so those uh, private payers need to develop these contracts. 
um, with the ACO in order for there to be a commercial participation in the agreement. This is, this is voluntary and we, however, we have, um, we certainly have work that, that we can do to highlight um, the, the significant benefits of this type of contracting arrangement that we have seen through our Medicaid Next Generation ACO program. And I would encourage you to do a deep dive on that, on that program um, and how it performs and what it has looked like over the last number of years. Um, we can certainly use our experience there in our Medicaid program um, to help commercial payers that may be interested in participation to understand uh, the benefits of this alternative contracting model with a network of providers who are aligned through an accountable care organization. Like we said yesterday, or like I said yesterday, <laughs> it feels like we because my family is all here with me. Uh, <laughs> as as I as I explained yesterday, the all payer model agreement is a five performance year agreement, and we are starting performance year four now. And with that, we have been able to observe three years of performance in the agreement, and to see where we have areas for improvement. And I talked through these four main buckets for improvement uh, yesterday. Um, and those include work at the state and federal level, work at the state level to, um, to ensure that we are prioritizing and aligning our healthcare reform activities with this model, uh, work at the state level on the regulatory framework and work at this at the ACO state ACO in the state um, uh, to to strengthen its approach to ensure that um, there is uh, the opportunity for the for the best amount of participation um, in this model as well as the to realize the most potential benefit um, from delivery system transformation and. At, at this time, um, I think it would make sense um, for Elena in her presentation to elaborate on the Green Mountain Care Board's work in monitoring and reporting on this agreement, because I think that that will help to demonstrate um, for you what we have, what and how we've been looking at the agreement and the performance in the agreement over the last performance years. And after that point, then, um, then I think that there will be more context for me to discuss some of the recommendations that we've made for improvement. Okay, uh, th thank you, Ina. Um, okay. Not being clear on, not being sure, you know, what our timing would be this morning. I had said we'd take a break between uh, Ina's presentation, a, a follow-up presentation, and hearing from Elena Barabe. Uh, why don't we take a five minute break and uh, people can get a, let's see, let's make it a time. So let's return at 9.35. We'll take a stretch break. Uh, we'll hear from Elena and then we'll take a, a longer break and we'll come back and hear from Ina and entertain a broader set of questions. Does that work for folks? So again, can I remind people that when we go on a break, please mute yourself and go off video. That's be appreciated. Thank you. We'll be back in five. And thank you, Ina. Uh, and I, I, I think that was helpful to have that recap uh, some more. So appreciate you taking that extra time to do that. And at this point, uh, Elena, let's turn to Elena Barabee from the Green Mountain Care Board to uh, discuss further what the Green Mountain Care Board's involvement role is and has been with uh, the all-payer model. Great. Um, so while I find my slide, oh, I, it looks like I'm still disabled from sharing. Okay, well, let's fix that. Uh, Colleen, can you, I think that will be something that Colleen needs to help with. Well, okay. 
Okay, here we go. Okay. Great. Okay, so I'll um, introduce myself first. I think. Yes, please. Know, please. I haven't do that. been yeah. in this committee too too often. Um, so Alina Barbie, I'm director of health systems policy with the Green Mountain Care Board. I've been with the board about a year and a half now. Before that, I was in education policy, tax policy. I worked in academia um, before that, and finance even before that. So I've kind of public private partnership um, experience um, from both sides. Um, so I'm here to talk about the role of the Green Mountain Care Board in the all payer model as um, we've been pointing to throughout this morning's conversation. Thank you so much for having us. Um, so, you know, the Green Mountain Care Board's role in healthcare reform broadly is really to serve as the regulatory body over the private healthcare um, segment of the healthcare market um, and with the goals of curbing healthcare cost growth and improving quality and population health. Um, the board also serves as a steward of healthcare data and provides analytics for both public consumption and for policymakers. Um, and this supports a transparent statewide view of costs and quality across the Vermont system of care. Um, so specifically in the all payer model agreement, um, there are kind of three key, you know, bodies of work um, that we focus on. Um, so we serve as a kind of a proxy for Medicare um, in some sense, and I'll talk about what that means. Um, we you know, work towards regulatory alignment. So we also have some other um, regulatory processes such as hospital budget review, um, CON, insurance rate review. Um, and so any you know, opportunities we have to kind of link um, those processes to the goals of the all payer model, you know, is a constantly evolving process. We look for ways that we can tighten um, those regulatory opportunities within our existing um, authorities. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, kind of the statewide healthcare data and analytics. So we do a lot of the reporting um, and analyzing kind of drivers of cost, um, cost containment and quality, um, and then report that um, out to the, our federal partners. Um, so in our role as a, as a proxy for Medicare, you know, we establish the healthcare spending targets, um, which is the mechanism for constraining fee-for-service healthcare cost growth um, in the agreement. Um, we also have the role of recommending program design modifications to the Medicare ACO initiative, um, so in, where there are opportunities to better align with other Vermont healthcare reform efforts and to kind of further the goals of um, you know, the Vermont healthcare um, reform as stated in, in staff. Um, in terms of regulatory alignment, as I mentioned, you know, this is not exhaustive, but, you know, in our hospital budget review, we look at um, how hospitals are engaging in healthcare reform efforts. You know, are they investing in community, um, community health improvement programs? What percentage of their um, revenues are fixed payment? So are they actually moving away from fee-for-service and is that enough sufficient to kind of drive the changes we want to see. Um, we also um, are responsible for uh, ACO or Accountable Care Organization budget review and certification for Act 113. Um, so there are, you know, specific criteria in the statute there, but as we also kind of think about the goals um, of the all-payer model and how these programs kind of align or how the ACO's programs align with those goals, um, and review their programs and their and their budget um, to understand kind of their how they're contributing to those um, to those goals, um, and we also get uh, health insurance rate review and and what our payers are doing um, in the commercial side of things to to kind of further our healthcare reform efforts. If I could just uh, interject here for a second, particularly for our newer. Uh, committee members, Act 113, which you're referring to, was a major initiative of this committee uh, a number of years ago. Uh, prior to that, the Green Mountain Care Board did not have regulatory authority or, over certifi or certification responsibility for uh, accountable care organizations in the state of Vermont. And after well, I believe it was a mere three or four years ago, but that does seem like yeah, well, a long time ago. Well, three or four years ago, but but nevertheless, uh, it's interesting as Act 113 is referred to as just an essential piece of what we're doing. Uh, some of us remember the period when we were trying to determine what that should include and how it should come into being. Uh, just, I think it's useful for our committee members in particular to, to understand that that's part of the work that this committee undertook, uh, like you say, a mere three or four years ago. Thank you, sorry, Elena, but just- No, that's great. Um, okay, so 
as it pertains to the you know healthcare data and analytics um, role, you know as I mentioned before, we report our, on our state's performance under the all payer model agreement on um, cost, uh, quality, population health outcomes, and scale. Uh, we also monitor for rationing or cherry picking, so that's you know trying to serve populations that may be more financially beneficial um, versus those that you know really. This is a Vermont wide model. We want to make sure that uh, these reform efforts are helping everyone. Um, and then we also analyze patterns in utilization and costs over time and across the delivery system. Um, so just you know, to be extra clear, I think Ina covered a lot of this, but just to you know, distill it down, what are we measuring? We're measuring uh, five-year healthcare cost growth. So you know, while we we report out on an annual basis to our federal partners, the accountability is really for the over the term of the agreement. Um, but we we kind of check and see if we're on track, and that's you know, our role in our board. Um, scale, payer and provider participation. So scale is, you know, how many uh, Vermonters does this model kind of touch? Um, but it's really a measure of payer participation and provider participation. And then Vermonters that are included under the model are those that are covered by a payer um, and have a relationship with a provider who is participating. So we track and report on that as well. Um, quality and population health outcomes. I'll talk about that in more detail in just a minute, but again, we um, kind of track and monitor our performance on quality and how that changes over time towards our three population health goals. Um, so here's a little bit more detail about these three areas. Um, in healthcare cost growth, you know, we're, we're tracking the per person spending on certain healthcare services, which we call total cost of care or TCOC. So you may see that um, language in various presentations. Um, we measure the spending growth for both the statewide all payer um, growth. So across commercial, Medicare, Medicaid, um, you know, across the state. We also look at it um, just for Medicare. So, you know, I think Ina talked a little bit about these targets, you know, is the all payer spending on track to be less than three and a half or 4.3% over the life of the agreement. And this was really to make sure that healthcare costs were tied to economic growth in our state um, based on an analysis done a number of years ago. And then, you know, for the Medicare population, is the Vermont Medicare spending growing more than the national average or, you know, they want us to perform below. So we look at that and, and compare to national average. Um, in terms of scale, I think, you know, I talked about this, it's really about, you know, payer participation, provider participation, and that is what lets us know who attributes under this model. That's what we, what we call when someone is, you know, included in this model as a Vermonter. Um, but we also kind of assess ACO programs for alignment, but also to determine if their scale target qualifying. So that happens through our ACO oversight process. Um, but has implications for our reporting under the all payer model. Um, and uh, as well as, you know, knowing which providers are participating also happens through our AC oversight process um, and which are participating in qualified programs. Um, and in terms of quality and population health, so, you know, I think Ina covered this, but, you know, we have these three population health measures to, um, or goals to improve access to primary care, to reduce deaths due to suicide and drug overdose, and to reduce the prevalence and morbidity of um, chronic disease. And so, you know, there are a number of population health measures that we track. We also track 22 quality measures that are then broken out into two kind of um, buckets, health delivery system quality targets and process milestones. And so, you know, Together, this framework should allow us to understand if the pieces um, are, you know, if we're doing the doing the things we need to do to really achieve those population health outcomes. Um, and so we look at this again on an annual basis um, and determine whether or not we are on track or we're making progress, um, or if you know there are areas of opportunity. So in terms of all payer scale, um, you know, I think Ina mentioned before these are you know, challenging targets. I think there are uh, populations included, um, you know, in, the, in those goals that we know that we have little um, influence over. Um, you know, that said, we have made significant progress over the last couple of years, um, but there is still room to grow. Um, and so this is in our all payer approach. So what we can see if we break this down by payer type is that, you know, we've seen significant progress in Medicaid 
Um, Medicare, you know, has grown, but, you know, there's still work to do. And I think Ina talked about um, kind of thinking about how we can make those, um, the payment program in Medicare more attractive and more like the Medicaid program. Um, and then and in the commercial sector, you know, there's, there's definitely room to grow. Um, you know, our fully insured population is growing, but, you know, our self funded population could see some um, improvement. In terms of the Medicare scale, you know, I think it's reflected in the all payer um, breakdown I showed you, but, you know, there is opportunity there as well. Um, so just to kind of ground, you know, what we're talking about when we're talking about all payer modeled cost growth and total cost of care relative to how we think about healthcare spending in the state. Um, you know, our, we have on the left is our total Vermont resident spend on healthcare. It's um, six point, almost 6.5 billion, right? Um, and our all payer model total cost of care services comprise about half of that. Um, you know, so I think we have to, you know, be real about what, you know, how much we expect to move the needle on healthcare with this approach. And then our ACO, our, our one ACO comprises 10% um, as of 2019. So this um, may have gone up a bit um, since then, but, um, you know, 2019 was 10% of total spending on behalf of Vermont residents. Um, and this kind of um, shows you, you may have seen this slide before, but you know, there's different costs of providing care to certain populations. So while we may have, you know, more or about this, you know, Medicaid, Medicare beneficiaries, Medicare um, costs a lot more per person than say Medicaid or commercial in terms of how we track these um, healthcare expenditures over time. And I think, you know, it sounds like we now have some experience on the committee on, you know, in terms of claims and coding, but I just wanted to kind of um, bring this slide forward again. I think Susan may have, um, and Kevin may have talked about it before, but it takes a really long time. Um, it's frustrating, but to get, to get accurate data uh, because we are relying on claims data and it takes claims um, a significant amount of time to kind of be incurred to be paid, you know, for payers to clean and scrub that data, for um, our contractors to clean and scrub that data, and for it to really become final and um, before it comes to the board for analysis. So, you know, this gives you an idea if, if patients incur claims in 2020, um, you know, the first three months in 2021, you know, they're still kind of paying and adjusting claims. And that can sometimes, that's three months run out, sometimes six months run out, you know, for quality, for example, we'll prolong this even further. Um, and then there's a significant, you know, there's time needed to kind of process that data. Um, so, you know, we may be in, in year four of the model, but the data that we have to look at and analyze is really year one, we're, we're starting to get year two. And, you know, before we have two points in time, it's really hard to kind of make, um, to generate some meaningful insights. So, you know, as we as we generate more meaningful insights and get access to more data, we're happy to kind of um, come back and report on what we're seeing there. And this is another example of kind of claims incurred and, and, and how they're paid and how it really is a, is a um, lengthy process. Um, you know, and I think just this is kind of a summary of all the reporting um, that we do. And I think, you know, GMCB leads some of this, but there are some reports that AHS also um, kind of takes initiative on, you know, the public health system accountability framework, um, and then the plan to integrate Medicaid and mental health um, services and, you know, uh, social services into the um, total cost of, of care targets. Um, so, you know, but we work together on a lot of these um, reports um, to make sure that we're, we're getting all of the pieces um, and, and really telling a coordinated story. So, uh, you know, total cost of care, um, quarterly reporting happens beginning of 2019. Some of these reports you can find already on our website. Of, um, you know, our annual differential um, payer report. So how are different payers contributing to the total cost of care? Um, and is the ACO, you know, changing the cost shift, um, if you will. Um, and the first annual scale target report. And I think we have a couple years of this report now. Um, we have one year of annual total cost of care so far, one year quality, but we expect um, the second year to come out shortly. Um, and then, you know, a proposal for a subsequent agreement is also included as a requirement in this um, all pair model agreement. And that is due at the end of 2021. Uh, so that is another important milestone. 
So I'll pause there for any questions. Well, I, ha I have a couple questions if I can just dive in and then I see there's there'll be some others. Um, Well, first of all, we're in year, uh, let's take the questions uh, slide down so I can see members. If we can do that, that'd be great. Good, thank you. Um, so we're in year four, am I right? Yes, we're entering year, year four. We're entering year, entering year four. four. Entered, yes. Yeah. Um, and just what you were just pointing out, the data lags behind for reasons that make a fair amount of sense, but I, I guess one question, and maybe I tap into your prior experience before being on the Green Mountain Care Board staff, uh, is the lag time uh, within, the lag time in terms of payments, closing that out, scrubbing the data, getting the data finally to the Green Mountain Care Board so the Green Mountain Care Board can actually use the data, is that, are there any national standards for uh, what what's 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 a best practice in terms of uh, getting data from the point of origin to the point of being able to use the data? Because it, it seems like a it seems like a long process, and then it then subsequently the question is, it the data becomes really retrospective rather than being primarily able to be used for directing or redirecting any changes. By the time we have the data, several more years of participation will have gone by. Right, I think that's a very good question. I think, you know, to answer the first part of your question, these three and six month um, claims run out periods is what we call them in healthcare is, is very standard. You know, I think it's just a, a a factor of the business process of the healthcare system and how we process claims and the coding and, and our payer processes around that. Um, you know, so I think we are we are following those standards to make sure that we have the most accurate data. So we're not um, we're not falling outside of no. national standards. It just right. seems unfortunately right unfortunately are, for everyone. <laughs> yes, and I, but I think we share your frustration about time. You know. You know, it's hard to make decisions when the data are so retrospective and adapt quickly. Um, and I think, you know, if there are other opportunities outside of claims to generate insights, you know, that's where maybe um, we can we can explore. Yeah. Okay, uh, and I'm going to indulge myself with a couple more quick questions, and uh, and then we'll turn to other questions from members. But we are also in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, I think at one point, I remember early on before the pandemic, there was some consider, we were reviewing some of this and I said, well, some of this assumes a, um, I don't wanna say natural, but a, a, a more or less standard progression of healthcare costs. It doesn't, uh, there's some provision for if there are extraordinary circumstances. And I think mm -hmm. one might say accurately that we are in the midst of a more than extraordinary circumstance uh, how has that, how is that impacting our ability to measure uh, the progress on this model? And have you, has the Green Mountain Care Board or the Agency of Human Services ad addressed that with our federal partners and et cetera? Yes, so I'll answer this and Ina, you can feel free to add um, since this is a coordinated question, but it, it will become, it is a significant challenge to measure kind of um, the impact of this model on, on healthcare cost growth over time. I think anecdotally, we expect, um, you know, the pandemic to reduce healthcare expenditures um, in 20 and in 21. So, you know, while we don't have the final data, you know, what we've seen so far kind of from our preliminary um, kind of views is that this, costs will not be the same. And it's really hard to understand, you know, what's a function of the pandemic versus what's a function of um, delivery systems. So I think we have had those conversations with our federal partners and they're very aware of this. And uh, we have um, some letters um, from earlier this summer 
um, where we express concern um, uh, with, you know, being held accountable uh, for, you know, a, a situation where we, it's really hard, you know, our providers are focusing on the pandemic and they need to, you be. Know, they need to be right. And um, so they may not be, you know, as engaged as they otherwise would be in some of these longer term um, and still very important initiatives. So um, they're working with us and, you know, I think, you know, we'll still be in, in good shape, um, but I don't know that we will have the kind of analytic insights about whether and if and how this model is, is working, if you will. Um, so that, that will be a challenge. But nevertheless, it's on the whole makes sense to continue moving forward despite what is clearly a major unexpected anomaly in terms of the healthcare system yeah. in Vermont and nationally. I guess I'm saying that and asking it as a question. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, we, we still need healthcare reform. We still need to pay for care differently. We still need to invest in prevention. I think those kinds of, um, those kinds of insights are still relevant and we still need to pursue them. Um, but I think in terms of quantifying statistically how far we've moved the needle, that is, that is the, um, the hiccup I, I would um, say for, for the pandemic and the all pair model. And perhaps Eno can comment uh, later as well. Okay, so I'm I'm going to I, I apologize. I don't know which hands came up first, so I'm just going to use my arbitrary choice. I'm going to go to Representative Houghton and then uh, uh, Representative Cordes of Black and Goldman, if you can go in that order, and we'll work our way through this. Great, thank you, and um, thank you both of you for your. Testimony. It's um, it's interesting having walked through this a couple of years in a row. I feel like the presentations are getting more refined and yes. um, more, really more comprehensive on what we're doing in a clear and concise way. So thank you for progressing with all of us on this journey that way. Um, so thank, thank, you for, thank you for saying that, Representative Houghton. I was having the same reaction having watched this over a period of years, thinking. I think I'm finally getting more of this. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. Yeah, maybe we're just finally getting it and it was always clear and concise, I don't know. <laughs> no, but, <laughs> thank it, but, but thank you. So I have, I have two questions. Um, one, and I hate to do this, but I'm hoping you can go back to your presentation, Elena. Sure. It was the um, question where you showed the healthcare spending. They were um, bar graphs, I believe. Um, so while you get there, I'll kind of preface why I'm asking this. So um, go down. Sorry, not that far. <laughs> this one? Uh, um, that one. So one of the things that I think is really important for our committee and really all of the legislative body in Vermonters is, is understanding what in the healthcare industry we as legislators have an impact on. And we often talk about, you know, there's Medicaid, there's self-insured, ERISA, and, and where do we fall? So I'm finding as we're as we're talking about scale and spending in the all-pair model, it's the same question. And so I'm wondering if this gets to that a little bit. I was hoping you could explain each bar graph again to me. Sure, I'm happy to. Um, so on the left, the 6.5 billion. So or sorry, yeah, so it's 6.5 billion, it's in millions, um, is total Vermont resident spend on healthcare um, in, in the state. So if you live in Vermont and you have a healthcare expenditure, that's captured there. So you could receive care from Dartmouth in New Hampshire, but you live in Vermont, you know, that's in there. Um, the all-payer model total cost of care, so as we talked about, is a defined set of services. Um, and I can tell you kind of what that excludes, if that's helpful. You know, it excludes um, federal, you know, various payers. So like federal um, employees um, coverage. Uh, and that's fine, but I think you're, yeah. I think you're getting to the, to what I'm trying to say, which is, so yeah. although the total spend is 6.5 billion, really this model really only has the potential to impact 3 billion. Is that? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah because of all the entities that are not covered under this, as well as- because Payers, as well as particular services. So okay. you know, there are other services that may not be included. You know, Pharmaceuticals, for example, are not included in the all-payer model or dentistry. Um, so you know, 
those would not be reflected in the cost containment strategies. Okay, thank you. And then if you can do the last bar graph. Yes, and then the last bar chart is the ACO total cost of care. So that's for the programs um, that are scale target qualifying under the all payer model that the ACO pursues. Um, and then so providers participating in that program. So together that um, amount of spending, if you will, they, ha they have an influence over 10% um, of the total healthcare spend in our state. And that is a number we would hope to grow. Yes. That is so to get to closer to that 3 point billion, but we're never really going to impact the 6.5 billion. Right. Not the way the agreement is currently structured. And, okay. um, you know, there are always opportunities to think about how we evolve this model. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. And then that's great. I'm done with the presentation. And then, um, Ian, I have a question for you, but it, you might talk about it later. So if you are going to, that's fine. Um, in regards to the role each signer pays, I'm pretty clear on what the ACO does and what Remount Care Board does. I'm still struggling with the role of, I don't know if it's the administration, if it's a, you know, I, I, that third piece of it. And if it if you get to it when you start explaining the recommendations, that's fine. We can wait. I think I can do a, a little bit now and then perhaps more with the recommendations. The agreement itself has three signatories, which are the Green Mountain Care Board, the chair of the board, the secretary of the Agency of Human Services, and the governor. The Agency of, of Human Services, the, the agreement specifies that the Agency of Human Services must offer a Medicaid ACO program. And that is our primary responsibility at the Agency of Human Services as prescribed by the agreement with the federal government. The Agency of Human Services also, as Elena described to you, is responsible to produce a report uh, to assess how we are holding uh, the ACO accountable in the state of Vermont for investing in um, population health initiatives. And so we submitted that report in the, uh, the summertime. Um, part of that strategy to hold the ACO accountable in the state of Vermont for making investments in population health activities is the regulatory apparatus of the Green Mountain Care Board in reviewing the ACO's budget to determine through its budget how it's investing. That, so that's another chief responsibility of the Agency of Human Services as prescribed by the agreement specifically. The agreement also asks that the agency submit a plan to um, a, a proposal for integrating additional Medicaid services into the total cost of care. And going back to Elena's bar chart, the center bar uh, describes the total cost of care. And so there are key Medicaid paid services that are not incorporated into those total cost of care, uh, into the total cost of care definition or targets at this time such as home and community-based services, uh, for instance. Again, I'll emphasize, while we are required to make a proposal around whether and how we incorporate additional services um, into a total cost of care target, that does not mean that we will necessarily make that recommendation. We need to explore whether it's appropriate to do so. And we have also been asked by CMMI and we are uh, working now on a timeline to align that proposal with a proposal for a subsequent agreement because a, sub, uh, a, a proposal for a subsequent agreement may include um, significant modifications to the total cost of care targets. So we need to understand what those could, could potentially be uh, before we choose or recommend rather that any additional services be subject to the spending target. Okay, thank you very much. And one, I'm sorry, Chair Lippert, one last quick question. Go ahead. Is, is there, uh, with, the, with the signature of the governor, is there anything specific to that signature or is it just the broad support from the state? Okay. The latter. Thank you. Great. 
Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Thank you for those questions. Uh, Representative Cordes, and then Representative Black, Golden, after, and Representative Page. Thank you, Elena and Ina. I have a micro question for uh, Elena, and then a macro question that could be both for um, Elena and Ina. The micro question is about, um, I think it's slide 10. It shows the scale target beneficiaries by payer type. And um, I was surprised um, at first, me and it, maybe it's not as small as it appeared at first, but the um, percentage of commercial self-funded um, So my question is, do you um, have access or can you share with us at some point, it doesn't have to be right now, um, who the self-funded um, insurers are or payers are um, in Vermont? Um, and I, I guess I, I thought that the that, that percentage would have been larger. Um, so I, I think, Ina, I would ask for you to weigh in here as well, because I know in the reboot that you're um, kind of looking at that. I mean, I think we can talk about who's who's in. Um, yeah, but I think uh, we can, yeah, we can dig into that a little bit for you. Thank you. And a related comment just um, at some point, and again, doesn't have to be now, um, there was a recent Supreme Court um, case in another state that um, changed um, ERISA um, regulations around pharmaceuticals. And just wondering if um, you think that there's potential for that to broaden into other aspects of healthcare, knowing that um, Pharmaceuticals are a huge part of the rate of increase of healthcare costs. Can, can I suggest that we take that question and, and give it to also uh, Jennifer Carby and, and others to bring back some comments to us at another point, uh, Representative Cordes? Sure. Because I think it's a broader, it's, a, it's an important and broader question uh, that goes beyond uh, the all payer model as well. Is that okay. satisfactory? Yep. So um, the macro question may be more of a, a comment. Um, just I understand the timeline of the all payer model and um, and the process for data collection um, and concurrent with um, this this five year project is the fact that. Um, we still have a lot of uninsured Vermonters. Access is still a huge issue. Um, oh. And I hope that we can um, find uh, on ramps in this process before the five years, um, the five year point to, to try to um, deal with that part of it. Yeah, yeah, and I think this model isn't aimed to, to, to do that, as you know, and I think Ina spent um, a great portion yesterday. I liked how you categorized the different healthcare reform initiatives over time. So this model is really focusing on, on kind of costs and quality, uh, cost growth and quality. So after, you know, the delivery side of things, but yeah, I agree you share right. your frustrations. Yeah, yeah I, think, I understand I think, that. Hence I, think it's important to, I think it's important for us as we look at range. this to understand those distinctions. Uh, and um, maybe we'll come back to that later in just some broader questions. I, I, I think many of us share the concern, but it's not something that this model agreement is crafted to address specifically. So it's something that is left unaddressed by us. Uh, Yes, that was hence my language, an on-ramp to, um, you know, a conversation about an on-ramp to other solutions. Yeah. Uh, Representative Donahue, you want to chime in here? Just to chime in, I, I, you know, this is something that came up last year as well. And I think the interim message was, yeah, this is not the focus except extremely indirectly in the sense that if we actually moderate the cost, 
then maybe it'll be more accessible for people to purchase insurance or whatever. So it's very, very tangential yeah, I, um, and, and is not actually addressing that leg of the, the stool. But I'm, I'm going to just take a, my option here as a chair to weigh in with, there are, there is, uh, and I'm going to ask, maybe we can address this later, but I'm just going to lay it on the table because I think, the language of these agreements, the names of this agreement is uh, leads to enormous confusion in the broader public who are unfamiliar with healthcare policy. When I hear statements made like, I support single payer, not all payer. And that that's completely a conflation of, uh, it's, it's, it's language which is bringing people to a conclusion that is not uh, an appropriate conclusion, in my view. Uh, and so I think, I think we need to be very careful in not uh, adding to the confusion that this, uh, just, it's just the language of that. And I, at some point, you know, I, I would welcome you or uh, others to speak to, you know, what, what that language confusion uh, or to just speak to that issue. So I'm going to go into the other questions. Uh, I think, and I again, I apologize. I think, but Representative Black, and then Representative Goldman, Representative Page. I have a million micro questions that I will not ask right now. Thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Since we know that you are, you are, you have an in-depth knowledge of coding that none of us will ever achieve, but uh, well, we'll. I've, and others. I've, and I've worked just, with one care for four years, and frankly, I'm not sure I understand it at this point. Yeah, so, I, I don't mean that um, as a dismissive yeah. comment. I apologize. <laughs> no, that's all right. I will ask a really cynical macro question. Okay. I understand the premise behind the all-payer model. I understand the incentive for payers for CMS. But if I'm a healthcare provider, why do I want to? Why do I want to save? healthcare dollars? Why do I want to decrease costs? What, what's in it for me? I mean, that's just lowering money that's coming to me. So where's the incentive? I will turn to either or both of you to comment. <laughs> I think the cost growth trajectory is unsustainable uh, as it is. And so there's um, the incentive is uh, a, a system that if it continues to grow at um, on the trajectory that it's on, a system that um, falls into uh, uh, disarray. And I think that the provider's incentive um, is very strong in caring for their patients and working within a system um, that is functioning so that they can provide care. Okay. Again, I'm going to just take the liberty of jumping in, but I think there is it, is it not also the case that um, moving from fee for service to value-based care gives a greater deal of flexibility to providers in terms of the kind of care that they can provide. And we hear regularly that providers are frustrated that they are not quote reimbursed for things which they know uh, they are an essential part of their care, but they can, so there's this perverse disincentive to, in some ways, and I think that goes to your question, Representative Black, there's in some ways a disincentive, there's, a, there's an incentive to escalate where possible appropriate care, but fee for service to cover those other costs as opposed to a value-based payment system which incorporates uh, the range of actions that providers know they participated in but don't get specific reimbursement for. I don't know if that's... No, I mean, I... I to add a, well, to add a single other word, predictability of payments is what we've heard a lot about. Yes. Uh, From the business perspective. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The predictability is important, but I just, I mean, I just can't... I think providers, yes, want to care for their patients utmost in their minds. Um, but they also have to remain profitable. And I, I, I don't know, I just wonder about the all payer model and 
really what's in it for them. Whether there are sufficient incentives built in to actually uh, move. To make them consistently profitable, I guess I would say. To, to, to build on um, a representative uh, Donahue's comment um, and, and, to, and to refer back to what I shared yesterday about the, the pandemic and the, the significant change in revenue from that. Of course, um, we, we hope not to experience a disruption of that kind regularly. However, it demonstrates very clearly the case for the predictable payment uh, to providers. And I think suggests that a predictable payment for providers could allow for um, providers to focus in other areas of their business um, and of their care model that would improve the outcomes and experience for Vermonters if they have, uh, they can rely on um, the, the revenue model um, that's provided through a budget and predictable payment. Uh, thank you. And as I say, there's, there's, there's many other questions and we can come back to some of those larger issues that you're touching on Representative Black as well. Uh, Representative Goldman and then Representative Page. Hi, and my internet's unstable, so I may go off uh, video if I have to, but thank you for your presentations. Um, I'm curious, and I actually have been contacted by constituents who are pretty concerned about the actual budget of the ACO itself. Um, and neither of you have touched on that, what, what kind of money is going into managing the ACO. And I'm curious about that. I'm not sure if this is the right place to look into it. I'm also curious about the relationship that um, UVM and Dartmouth have with the ACO. Um, it's sort of that whole management piece. I was looking at something from 2019 and had a list of the people involved. It was the CEO of UVM and a high level executive from um, Dartmouth. And I'm interested in those relationships with the ACO at some point. I'm not sure if you're prepared to answer that now. Um, so that's one question. I have another too. Again, I'm, I'm going to suggest that we might save some of those questions for uh, a further opportunity when we're both hearing from one care as well as from some of the, uh, from the Green Mountain Care Board and uh, the agency. I think there's a whole range of questions that uh, that, that touches on. Yeah, thank you. Just I just want to get them on the table so that we can sure. circle back. Yeah, they're not they're not questions that have they're, they're questions that have been raised before and will continue to be. Uh, yeah, yeah. Be I'm getting actually surprising amount of pressure about it because the negative vibe about the ACO and I think that contributes to it. So it would be wonderful to address yeah, that. We will. Um, I'm, this is on the more micro scale. So you were talking about increasing scale, and I was wondering how you increase scale in Medicare. What would that process look like? Uh, I can begin, and Elena can 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 also add um, the the Medicare the Medicare program. If if as Elena described, if you think about how we achieve scale or how scale is counted, the first relationship that needs to be established is the relationship between the payer and the accountable care organization. So any participating payer needs to have a contract with the accountable care organization. In the case of Medicare, uh, Medicare has, the Medicare offers a program and, and the accountable care organization participates in that program with Medicare. So that Medicare and, and the ACO are, are offering a program together. Then the ACO, um, then the ACO needs willing providers to participate in that payer program that it's offering. And it is the willing providers um, that would be interested in participating in the Medicare program um, that would, more willing providers would need to participate in the Medicare program with the ACO in order to increase scale in the Medicare program uh, we do have um, an example of a recent um, provider who's choosing to participate, uh, Rutland Regional Medical Center, 
is participating starting in the 2021 or performance year four uh, with the ACO in the Medicare program for the first time. And so that is a, uh, a having an impact on Medicare scale. Okay, so then if I may, um, if I understand it right, then it is in a way, once the sort of overarching agreement is designed with whomever it might be, the commercial, it could be a commercial Medicaid, well, Medicaid, no, that's probably not, but Medicare, then it's provider driven to have to be able to agree to participate. Is that what I'm understanding? Okay, and if I may, um, Chair Lippard, ask one more question. On slide eight, one of the goals was increasing access to primary care. And I'm wondering where that stands. I didn't see any data on the success of that effort. Um, you also related it to the a hospital responsibility, if I understood that right, within that region. So I'm just wondering how that gets done. Yeah, so I, I think we can, I can do a deeper dive. I would point you to our quality report to see kind of how we're performing on those measures. And I can, I can attach the link um, where you submit the materials um, if that's helpful. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we'll have the 2019 data um, in the next month or so. So I, you know, I think we can look at 19 data would probably be the most, um, the most up to date. So I would, I would kind of want to look at that to, to, before I answered your question. So can I just follow up? So you know, 19 data obviously is pre-pandemic. So how useful is that given our brave new world? I think it tells us something about how we were doing. I think we might need to think about what is different now that the pandemic is in play. You know, people are receiving care differently. And I, I would really, you know, point to Ina for this one because she's kind of leading a lot of, of these efforts and coordinating that. So, but I think we do need to think about, you know, how should our measures change in the next model? Are we going to be relying more on telehealth and that kind of thing? So and I don't think Ina can answer more, more directly, um, but yes, we should think about it. Thank you. Thank you. This, this here. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm okay. This, this, I think we're doing, okay. it's, it's 10, 10, 30. I want to give Ina time to finish, uh, to come back to her presentation. Uh, let's, I think Representative Page, you had a question. And then, and then I think I'm going to ask folks to hold their questions for now so that we can, uh, well, we'll collectively decide whether we're taking a break or we're going to hear directly from Ina. So be thinking about what break you want or don't want. <laughs> Representative Page. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, my question goes back to what Representative Houghton was talking about with the model, growing the ACO model. Um, earlier in the year, I believe it was the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid sent a warning letter to the state of Vermont. Is that related uh, to, to that, that bar chart that you showed? I'm seeing you nod your heads. Yeah. Is, is that a, affirmative? Yes. Okay. And then as a result of it, um, the state then said, we're going to open this up to um, Vermont state employees. So does that bar chart, and maybe, maybe um, the, the, uh, the union hasn't agreed to that yet. I, I don't know. Um, but is that data in, in that bar chart to include um, state employees being allowed to have access to that? I don't believe they're included in the bar chart, but I'll let Ina speak to your other questions on strategy. And, and then I guess the other question is, what do state employees get out of, uh, out of having access to this? that they didn't already have before. So I'll leave it there. Yeah, and, and, and with that, I'm gonna step in and say, because that's exactly, I mean, some of those issues are exactly what we've asked uh, Ina Backus to tell us about in more detail uh, in her next section of testimony, which is the Agency of Human Services, uh, upon receipt of that letter, uh, Secretary Smith asked for a reevaluation of our progress on the all-payer model. Uh, that 
that has been completed. There's a report and that's what Ian is going to update us on. Uh, that, those very questions that are tied to the question that you raised, Representative Page. Uh, and it touches on, I think, includes the issue of state employee participation. So I, I think I am going to suggest that while I'm asking others to hold questions right now, just in, res in response to our own health care needs, I'm going, I am going to suggest that we take a break uh, and that we come back and then hear from Ina and, and then we'll have time for open questions and we'll, we'll be finishing up by uh, quarter to 12 at the latest. So again, in our own interests of our health and health care, our health rather than our health care, uh, let's take a break and let's come back at, uh, let's take a 10 minute break and come back at 1040. Please be back on the screen then. In the meantime, please mute and stop your video. Thank you. Let's continue with hearing from uh, Ina Bacchus uh, to pick up on the question of the agency human services response in part or in large part to a letter from CMS or well, let's clarify was the letter from CMS or CMMI and et cetera. So let's, let's turn to uh, Elena, I mean, not Elena, well, Elena in the background, but from Ina to provide us with inf further information and then we'll continue with questions uh, as we have time. Hopefully you can hear me. I, I can, um, yes, yes, I can. Okay, yes. Yeah, in, in, in September, the, the state of Vermont uh, did receive a warning notice from the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, uh, with whom, which is a part of CMS, um, with, whom we with whom we have the agreement uh, for Medicare's participation in Vermont's model. And the warning notice um, did, did indicate that the state um, had, had uh, underperformed on the scale targets that are in the agreement um, and asked that the state uh, uh, propose um, a ask that the state respond to that warning notice. The warning notice is not a corrective action plan. Um, we, were not, we were not asked to submit a corrective action plan. I do wanna differentiate between those um, activities, but the warning notice was um, to indicate uh, that the state was underperforming and to ask that the state respond to that and uh, which we did um, with, with a proposal um, for impacting scale, um, which aligns with the implementation improvement plan that the Agency of Human Services put forward in November of 2020. The implementation improvement plan certainly, as I just described, is responsive uh, to the underperformance on scale targets, but the implementation improvement plan is, is also more broad in looking at a number of areas in the agreement where we, um, where we uh, believe that we can perform better in totality all of the partners uh, in this agreement, um, both public and private and where um, the, we, we do have metrics that we need to meet um, for the agreement that are not exclusive to the scale targets um, as well. So like we've talked about um, certainly improving the, for instance, um, prevalence, reducing prevalence and morbidity of chronic disease is a key metric in this agreement. And there are recommendations in our implementation improvement plan um, that speak to accelerating the progress in that, in that arena uh, as well. And so I'll, I'll orient you, um, there is a comprehensive report which you can um, read at your, at your leisure uh, that, that details and provides 
uh, context for the findings and the recommendations. This uh, summary that I will share with you now of recommendations um, is oriented in, in the four major categories of recommendations that I've described. Recommendations about our federal state partnership, recommendations about the Agency of Human Services own approach, um, recommendations about the Green Mountain Care Board's regulatory evolution, as well as recommendations um, for the ACO. And so here in these charts, and I'll share four, four of them with you, the recommendations are described as, um, in terms of their timing, what we're looking to do in the short term versus longer term timeframe. Longer term is described as beyond year 2022, uh, the medium term is described as year 2022 and short term because this plan came out in November was described as 2020 and 21. So of course now when we're talking about short term, we're talking about what's happening in 2021. Um, we, we indicate the leads on these recommendations in this, in this table, as well as the uh, domain of the agreement that the recommendations are, are intended to make an impact. And, uh, oftentimes you will see that many domains could be impacted by the recommendation. That's because uh, the, the different components of the agreement certainly are, um, are uh, uh, they interact with one another um, and there is, there is a total impact um, that is often, uh, uh, that is often a function of scale, for instance, um, of the, of the, um, of the agreement. So also I'll begin now in describing these recommendations. Um, the, in, in the arena of our federal and state partnership, we, we recommended that we do need to work with our CMS partners to be sure that the scale targets that we have in this agreement are reflecting a realistic capacity for participation. And right now the scale targets do hold us accountable for some Vermonters to be attributed to this model um, that cannot functionally be attributed the way that the model is set up. And we would like to work with CMS to see if we can be, um, for lack of a better term, relieved of that responsibility where the state actually doesn't have any, uh, the state doesn't have any power to make an impact. Um, that that doesn't uh, those changes we think are fair and are important so that their the scale targets are realistic. However, they those changes don't um, suddenly make scale a problem that doesn't need to be addressed in other ways as well. It's not just that the numbers are wrong and we're doing just fine. We do need to increase the participation of payers and providers in this agreement. But we thought it was important to reflect uh, a realistic target as well. We are, um, we, we also have um, accomplished the reduction of the risk corridor thresholds for the Medicare program that the ACO is participating in. The, the risk corridors, um, what their value there was, uh, previously was such that it was creating a, a, a significant financial burden uh, for participation um, for particular hospitals. Um, and and in, in, with COVID-19 really posing a, a burden of participation for any, for any participant. Uh, working with the Green Mountain Care Board as signatories in the agreement, there, there was a proposal made um, to CMS to reduce the risk corridor thresholds um, in the near term. And that proposal was accepted and has occurred for the 2021 performance year. And therefore we are seeing some more participation in the Medicare model than perhaps we otherwise would have seen. Um, as I indicated, um, the Rutland Regional Medical Center has, has joined the program. Can you say something more about, is this, does it, I, am I remembering that 
there was a proposal to basically hold harmless for uh, some period of the pandemic from the risk corridor, or is that, am I confusing several things here? The, the risk corridor proposal is, it is a near term proposal, meaning for this 2021 performance year, um, it is, it is not necessary. It, it is not necessarily um, uh, correlated uh, uh, specifically to the pandemic. Okay. Can I add one thing though? I we there is no lower. There is no risk for the duration of the public health emergency. So um, there is only upside risk and no downside risk. Um, uh, just across all of the Medicare um, models. Can you can you say say that again in a different way so that when you describe ups, upside and downside risk? So there is there is no risk to um, participating ACOs um, or providers um, participating in these alternative payment models for the duration of the public health emergency. Um, so this risk corridor, which specifies what you can win if you, you know, save healthcare costs or save on healthcare spending versus what you lose by overspending on healthcare. Um, now, if if there is, you know, if you don't hit those targets that are prescribed and you overspend, you're not going to be held accountable to repaying that um, to CMS for the duration of the pandemic. And is that is a measure of the duration of the pandemic measured by a federal declaration? It is, yes. And what what is that? Do you can you remind us what the federal declaration current? I know at the state level it's renewed. It's been being renewed monthly or something close to that, and I believe there's something different. I'll, I'll have we can get back to you on that. I think we expect it to extend quite a bit into 21, from what we've heard. Um, at the very least, um, you know, there are a lot of variables at right. play. A lot can, going on with the pandemic, yeah. which would impact all of this. So, yeah, that's what I was trying to point to as well. So thank you. Thank you, Elena. You're welcome. In order to improve participation in this model, we also um, would like to work further with CMS to ensure that we have clear guidance for the cost reporting requirements that critical access hospitals have. Uh, critical access hospitals have cost reporting requirements as a critical as a critical access hospital when when they are participating in an alternative payment model. Um, how they meet those cost reporting requirements becomes complicated. We are really looking um, to be able to disentangle the, that complication for the critical access hospitals so that it's very clear um, how they are to meet that obligation of reporting even though they are participating in this alternative payment model. We also propose to establish a path for the Medicare payment model to mirror the Medicaid next generation fixed perspective payments. I mentioned this a couple of times already in my testimony that while the Medicare model is innovative for Medicare, it is not as innovative as our Medicaid model is. And we, and our Medicaid model offers a true fixed perspective payment that is not reconciled to fee for service performance. Um, and, and, and that is where we want the Medicare program as well to go. Um, we need to evolve the Medicare model further so that um, providers are, are getting a true budget and that that budget through the Medicare model is not then being trued up to the fee-for-service claims that, that are coming in through the system. Rather that if the providers in the Medicare model perform well in that budget, then um, those, those savings um, due to that performance are ones that they keep. The, the, the Medicare model can be simplified. Said another way, the Medicare model can be simplified and the payment can be operationalized um, to be more attractive. 
We also propose and recommend that um, the Medicare 2021 benchmark provides as much stability and predictability as possible, despite the ongoing uncertainty associated with the pandemic. And this, this actually came up in discussion um, related uh, to our, our earlier presentation this morning um, in terms of how the pandemic is impacting this model. Um, certainly the, the, the pandemic is, is completely unforeseen in the planning of this model and also really needs to be taken uh, strongly into consideration as we are using in the model um, historic performance in delivering healthcare services to be able to set future healthcare spending goals, budgets, targets, and so on. And when we have a disruption like the pandemic where usual patterns of care are, are far from normal, we have to be very careful in how we then use patterns of care to set a growth rate um, or a benchmark for a future performance year. Um, so we are working with our partners to ensure um, the most stability uh, that, we can, that we can given these factors. We also it, it would also seem that it's imperative to actually un, to try to as much understand as clearly as possible what the impact of the pandemic actually has been. So that, uh, I, I mean, I've frankly, over the course of the past period of months during the pandemic, there have been both speculation as to what would be happening and there's some data as to what has been happening uh, in terms of reduced use of healthcare and others saying, well, they expect a surge in use of healthcare following certain periods of, you know, closing down elective care, et cetera. So it, it, I think there's a lot, there's a lot to understand what's, what the actual impact has been or is, is happening and has been. Absolutely. There, there is an imp, there has been an impact. There will likely be impact moving forward. And we, and we can also look back to preprint pandemic patterns of care and use those to inform what we would expect healthcare spending to look like in a as we recover. Um, so I, th I think that that's, that's, the, that's the work that needs to be undertaken in partnership, um, certainly with our federal and other payer partners. We recommended finally in, in relationship to our federal and state partnership that um, the state collaborate with CMS, CMMI, uh, to encourage the Health Resources and Services Administration, also known as HRSA, um, which governs the program for the federally qualified health centers, to prioritize how federally qualified health centers can participate in value-based payment models so that um, we, have, we have and can describe opportunities for federally qualified health centers in this model. And that's a, that's a longer term recommendation, but in, an important one when we are aiming for a system-wide approach and a system-wide adoption of the fee-for-service alternative methodology. The next category of recommendations focuses on the agency of human services and how it prioritizes and reorganizes uh, to align with the goals of the all-payer model. The first recommendation is for the agency of human services to conduct education and outreach to non-participating self-funded groups. As I said, the Agency of Human Services through its Medicaid program has a particular experience um, in contracting and paying for healthcare differently that is educational for other payers that are considering uh, participation. And in, in, in the immediate term, we also uh, would recommend the participation of the state employee health plan members for attribution to one care in performance year four, 2021. And that, um, as you are aware, uh, that decision has been made and the state employee health plan members will be attributed to one care Vermont in 2021. Representative Page asked what the benefit of, of that would be for those members 
uh, the benefit is um, those members uh, the, are, are going to be attributed to the Accountable Care Organization, a network of providers taking responsibility for cost, quality, and outcomes. There, um, and, and therefore, the, um, the activities of care coordination um, and improving the delivery system will touch uh, those, those um, and can benefit the state employee plan members. Um, as, as well as the state employee health plan members um, benefit, benefiting from the system-wide, um, participating in a system-wide approach to um, cost growth moderation. Representative Page, you wanna? Well, yes, just a quick question. What, effects, what effect will it have on um, this policy? What effect will it have on our primary care um, providers. Do we know that yet? Will I have any? Either pro or con? Are you referring to the, I'm, sure, I'm not sure your question, are you referring to the state employees particular? <clears throat> yes, yes. Participation? Yes, thank you. Uh, pr primary care providers are, 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 are delivering care and are doing so in, in this um, model uh, for their for their patients and I think that if you ask a primary care provider um, they will they will probably answer that they're they're coordinating care and delivering care consistently across all of their patients kind of regardless of, of payer of who's paying but I think when when we um, when we have more people attributed uh, to this model, and more payment is provided for in a value-based manner, that the incentives for the system to emphasize um, the work that primary care does and to, um, and to ensure that primary care is, um, is, is supported in its prevention and health promotion activities, uh, that those incentives get stronger with more payments being value-based than fee-for-service. Well, that, that may be correct, but it also, won't it also put more stress on the system, more stress on, on these providers that are already um, perhaps have enough uh, to do as already? I think that there's a very important balance um, and, and calibration of how we measure, um, how we measure the uh, care delivery and primary care providers um, are subject to measurement. And I think that there's very good work happening in the field uh, to be able to, to, be able to um, look at the, the measures um, and evaluate the measures and ensure that those measures are um, contribute, contributing to the outcomes that we want to see. Um, and certainly evaluating where um, where emphasis should be uh, applied, um, and and to try to uh, streamline administrative burden where possible. The 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 alignment goals in the model are certainly um, are certainly aimed at addressing some administrative burden for providers who in the system left alone, the system has um, a host of different rules and regulations that differ by every single payer. Um, the spirit of this model is to try to align rules and regulations so that they look an emphasis on care, care quality to align that across payers so that there is a, a more single focus for providers rather than myriad focus dependent on the payers that they contract with. We also um, recommend uh, that we prioritize the integration of the claims and clin clinical data in the health information exchange and organize the health information exchange activities within the Office of Healthcare Reform in the Secretary's Office at AHS so that this work can be coordinated, uh, can be ideally coordinated with um, certainly the all-payer model and so that the 
um, work of the HIE steering committee is as coordinated as it can be uh, to align with the goals and outcomes in the all payer agreement. We also recommend partnering with One Care Vermont and delivery system users to evaluate the efficacy of the Care Navigator platform. Um, I, I, I would certainly encourage One Care, um, when you speak with One Care, to describe Care Navigator and, and how it is um, meeting the needs of care coordination uh, for, for its network. Uh, however, we are recommending this activity because there has been a lot of feedback from the field that Care Navigator um, can be improved. And we want to be responsive to that feedback. And we think that the, the certainly the um, Care Navigator platform or the Care Coordination platform um, is essential for the delivery system reform um, that needs to that needs to allow for more coordinated care across care settings and across uh, different provider types. We uh, we will consider through a phased uh, approach conditioning um, provider participation in the Agency of Human Services Blueprint Program and in the in the patient centered medical home payment component of that program um, uh, in particular to be contingent on participating in the value-based payment arrangement with an ACO. We, the blueprint is a foundation um, for healthcare reform. It is providing uh, very important resources to strengthen primary care and to provide for community health schemes, but the blueprint is not moving the system away from fee for service. We would like to see um, potentially with time, the blueprint be a foundation that is aligned with our goals to move away from fee for service. This is a longer term recommendation, but I do wanna note here that in the 2021 performance year, for those providers that are taking risk in the Medicare program, that they will, those providers who are participating in the ACO, taking risk in the Medicare program, they will be receiving a slight increase in blueprint payments over those providers who are not participating uh, in the Medicare ACO program. This is a small incentive to participate in the ACO uh, model. The next recommendation, AHS, One Care Vermont and community providers should improve collaboration to strengthen integrated primary specialty and community-based care models for people with complex medical needs and medical and social needs. And in order to accomplish this, the Vermont um, Chronic Care Coordination Initiative will be organized along with the Blueprint for Health in the Secretary's Office. This recommendation really looks at the role of AHS as a partner in this agreement and in particularly in providing for care that is coordinated across a diverse number of settings. And um, we, we seek to better align this coordination and certainly um, to be working in partnership with our healthcare partners, including One Care Vermont to strengthen uh, the degree of coordination that's happening across uh, community-based care settings in particular. We also recommend that the Agency of Human Services along with One Care Vermont and community provider partners identify a timeline and milestones for incorporating social determinants of health screening into the standard of care in health and human services settings. We also recommend that the Blueprint for Health, uh, along with One Care Vermont uh, and AHS, um, explore jointly with stakeholders the best available tools for capturing real-time patient feedback. And this is in particular to the primary care, um, access to primary care outcome that we are looking to improve. Um, we're looking to improve access to primary care 
we think that there could be some um, real opportunity in having some better real-time feedback about access um, and experience with primary care. Uh, we don't have a good um, methodology at this time to really have a sense of what's happening on the ground in the, in the very near term with respect to access to primary care. Mm -hmm. Finally, the Agency of, <laughs> of <Admi> <laughs> Agency of Human Services, excuse me, and the Green Mountain Care Board, uh, together we are looking to prioritize regular stakeholder engagement opportunities. And I, um, I, I do recognize that this activity, uh, we, we have it uh, absolutely as a short-term priority and we do and will be engaging in this activity, uh, recognizing that stakeholder engagement opportunities look differently uh, in the pandemic um, and that the way that those will be offered um, are, are in the short term going to need to be remote and also need to be cognizant of the considerable uh, work that our partners are all doing in response to the pandemic at this moment in time. Recommendations for um, the Green Mountain Care Board in, in and thinking about the regulatory um, response or the regulatory structure uh, that's governing our, our healthcare um, partners as we implement this agreement. The Green Mountain Care Board um, and AHS together will request, will request that Blue Cross Blue Shield Vermont as well as MVP and OneCare Vermont identify clear milestones for including fixed prospective payments in contract model design. This is really a partner recommendation to the one um, where we are looking for our federal partners to move more quickly in including a fixed prospective payment component in the Medicare payment model. This is mirroring that recommendation, but for our commercial payer participants in this model. The commercial, the commercial payment model is again, not as advanced as we would like it to be in including a true fixed prospective payment component in its contract uh, model design. Under the authorities of both ACO and hospital budgets, the recommendation here is for that the Green Mountain Care Board should explore how ACO participants can move incrementally towards value-based incentives with the providers that they employ. That means uh, if you are in a alternative payment model uh, and the model is emphasizing, um, for instance, a, a certain quality outcomes that perhaps providers through their contracts will be rewarded for the quality outcomes over um, other potential uh, uh, contract components um, that emphasize the volume of services performed rather perhaps than the quality of services performed. Annually in its budget presentation to the Green Mountain Care Board, One Care Vermont should identify the cost growth drivers across its network and detail its approaches to curb spending growth and improve quality. And finally, recommendations relative to the ACO's uh, leadership strategy and how to strengthen that leadership strategy, I think in particular, um, both to capture more participation in this model, but also um, certainly to maximize on the potential of the model to moderate cost growth and improve quality. We recommended in our report that OneCare should elevate data as a value added product for its network participants and provide the necessary support for those providers for leveraging this information for change. We recommended OneCare focus on entrepreneurship and how in trying to attract more participation, it can ease providers transition to value-based payment and delivery system redesign. We recommended uh, in addition that OneCare identify and perfect its core business. 
provide useful, actionable information and tools to participating providers. And this recommendation is really coupled with um, what you see as number 13, and that OneCare should improve how it packages data for providers. We recommend OneCare foster a culture of continuous improvement, innovation, and learning through this focus on data and providing systems for improvement and systems for tracking of results so that providers can see uh, how their interventions are clearly linked to changes in results. And finally, improving transparency and responsive to, responsiveness to partner requests for information, um, both partner, payer partner requests uh, for information as well as regulatory requests for information. And that those are those are our four areas of recommendations. Uh, I might note for those who have had the report, either in electronic or printed form, that a good deal of this, not all of them, but a good deal of this are summarized on pages 20, 20 and 21 of the report. Uh, if you've had the chance to look at the report as well. Um, so I see that we have some questions. Uh, I, I'm going to start. I'd like to throw out one question first. Uh, thank you, Ina. And um, so we're sitting here as the legislature, uh, as the healthcare committee of the House, reviewing uh, these recommendations, understanding, trying to understand the all of the various dynamics at work in the accountable care organization model, uh, which is an agreement that uh, was authorized to be signed in Act 113, and which is a, where, where the signatories are the Agency of Human Services, the Green Mountain Care Board, and the governor. Um, what a question that has that comes to mind is uh, in the recommendations listed here. Are there any, there, were, there do not appear to be any directed recommendations to the legislature per se. Uh, and I'd like to ask you to comment on that. There are not any directed recommendations to the legislature, that's correct. The recommendations are really directed at the partners in the agreement that were described in that pillar diagram, um, both the partners and signatories on the agreement, as well as those partners uh, who are essential partners for implementing the agreement, payers and providers and accountable care organizations. And so uh, the recommendations are ones that um, are made uh, uh, in, in the spirit of those, of those entities um, having uh, within their means um, the resources to make progress on these recommendations absent legislative action. Great. And would it be fair to say that the recommendations, uh, which are you know, numerous and directed toward different entities uh, are premised on the fundamental decision of the agency human services to continue moving forward with this model uh, through the period of the contract and to, or the uh, agreement uh, and to uh, pursue a possible, uh, to pursue, to negotiate a further agreement or possibility of a further agree, agreement. Can you speak to, because I think, I think one of the questions that is raised in the public's mind is the letter from the, the quote warning letter is this a letter that suggests that the agency is, the agency or the governor or the Green Mountain Care Board is contemplating stepping away from this agreement at this point in time? And I think that's, while it's not stated in the recommendations, it's implicit, but I think it needs to be made explicit. And I wish you'd, and I'd like to ask you to comment on that. Absolutely, we are not stepping away from this agreement at this time whatsoever. We are, we are stepping in to identify where we can make this agreement work as well as it possibly can uh, for the state of Vermont to realize its goals of moderating healthcare cost growth and improving healthcare quality 
and moving our state uh, further towards a more seamless model of, of care across settings um, and across a variety of settings um, that are important to health and well being in partnership with healthcare settings, but not exclusively to what we would think of as healthcare settings. Okay. And, and, and then lastly, is there, is there current activity in looking toward the possibility of a, re, of a negotiation for a further extended agreement or a new agreement? Uh, certainly, uh, we know that with that the agreement lays out um, timelines for proposing a next agreement, which is helpful. So we are we are having we are certainly aware of what those timelines are, um, and are and are talking about how we approach how we approach the requirements that are in the agreement. Which um, there is that it is it is required that we propose a, a next agreement um, in in about a little less than a year's time from now. So there's a lot more to be heard about that at yeah. a future point in time, right? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, and again, I think, I think given the, the range of questions that are being raised, that have been raised uh, by different stakeholders, or not just even stakeholders, but by Vermonters and others, uh, uh, I think it's important to be explicit that the administration uh, continues to stand behind moving forward with improvements on this agreement and not stepping away from this agreement. That's correct. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Representative Donahue and then Representative Black, Representative Page. I think we're doing okay. Uh, Representative, both... Representative Black was ahead of me. I'm choosing to ask you to ask your question oh. first. I'm the chair oh. of the committee at the moment. <laughs> Thank you. I just didn't want to no, I understand. So I, just, I, I just felt yeah. like it was useful for. I, I, let me explain. Uh, it is my it is my practice as a chair to try to give voice to per, persons who have not yet had a chance to speak or speak very often. And I'm not trying to stifle Representative Black in any manner. Thank you. Um, and, and this sounds like a comment because it starts out that way, but it it really is a, a question or um, information. I, you know, there's been a huge frustration with this process because it seems to be such slow progress on reform and usually the response is well but it's it's huge it's a huge change to make it's really pretty um uh it it takes a while for this degree of change one of the things that um has not been clear and you referenced it a little bit is when we talk about scale of participation that actually a lot of that participation is not participation, is not participants who are actually doing payment reform yet. They're signed on, but they're still using fee for service. So that fundamental shift isn't occurring. I think it'd be helpful to know those percentages. I know that for instance, from your material, the um, private providers are maybe even further behind on how much participation includes a change away from fees for service. But, but knowing those percentages for those categories, I think would, would help. But the even bigger piece from the start, it's been really clear that scale is critical. This will not succeed unless it has, um, you know, the vast majority of Vermonters participating. Um, and it's always been, it's been an ongoing worry of mine that we haven't been meeting targets for scale. And I know it's a chicken and egg. You can't get people willing to join if they're not seeing, or it's harder if they're not seeing benefits, but they're not going to see the benefits without a bigger scale. So, uh, you know, your first bullet point there, it's, it's a concern to me um, about progress of the model to say we're going to revise downward the, the targets of what we hope to achieve um, for scale. And I guess I, I would like to know how much. I think it'd be helpful. I don't think we had a slide in this overview yet. We had one that showed what percentages were participating. 
but there used to be one that also showed in comparison to the target, the tar the because there was a target for each year of progress and how much behind those are would be helpful to see, as well as to see the contrast to what is being proposed for um, new targets for participation. I'll speak to that question first. The, the intent of the scale target, if we are successful, and we may or may not be, is not to move away from the preponderance of Vermonters being attributed to this model because of the principle that you just stated that it's, it's not going to be successful unless most of the payment in the system is changed. Uh, however, the, the success of providers in managing care also happens in how the care is delivered uh, coordinated and the structure of the delivery system. There are some Vermonters that are not receiving the majority of their healthcare in our state. And for those Vermonters who are getting most of their healthcare out of state, their attribution to the model is number one, it, it's not funk, we can't do it because their providers aren't in the state of Vermont. And number two, those Vermonters that are receiving most of their care out of state for a variety of reasons, that care can't be managed by our system to improve it. And so they are not realistic for attribution to the model in our estimation that it's not a significant number. Um, it does not, I don't think that it would detract from anyone's assessment that the preponderance of the of Vermonters would still need to be attributed. Um, the first question you asked about the um, about the percentage of of payment that is moving away from fee for service, I this this um, I, I do want to be clear that all of the payment models um, for the most and, and Elena can can perhaps um, give you the overview of, of exactly um, the way each contract. Uh, looks and shapes up, they qualify, these models do qualify as ACO scale target initiatives, and they meet the requirement of our state and federal agreement as being alternative payment models. Um, in the eyes of the federal government and in the eyes of um, what's called the Learning Action Network, which has a framework for moving away from fee for service, the commercial contracts with OneCare are, are moving away from fee for service because they have a shared savings component, they have risk, and they have a value component. So they are, they are not just traditional fee for service um, pay, just pay as you go with no connection to quality or value. Um, there is, those do exist there, but we are really trying to push the envelope and push further for that true fixed prospective payment to be a feature of the contracts. And, and we are really emphasizing because we agree that that is going to have, that is going to ultimately be the strongest incentive and provide the best predictability as we saw with the pandemic. But I did wanna make that distinction and, and be clear that while we're pushing really hard for that, the contracts um, that exist today, they are not just fee-for-service um, as, as usual. They, they are innovative it, too. <laughs> yeah, I think it would still help to kind of know what those breakdowns are and, yeah. and particularly most basic that um, the difference between current um, percent attribution and target, the, what the targets had been. Yep. Thank you. I, I, I can clarify on the, on the fixed payment if you're interested in that. Um, so I think in terms of all fixed payments, that includes Medicare, which is primarily a cash flow mechanism. Um, based on OneCare's 2021 budget, that's about 34% of the dollars flowing through OneCare. So if you remember back to that bar chart, in terms of our total healthcare expenditures, it's 34% of 10%. If we're talking about truly fixed payments, 
um, that's really only the Medicaid contract. That's only 12% of the dollars flowing through one care. So 12% of the 10% of our, all of our expenditures. So that shows you just, you know, it's a very small slice. Um, and I think there might be some, you know, population-based payments out, you know, for that outside of that, that might increase that a little bit, like for blueprint, et cetera, but. Thank you. Uh, Representative Black, uh, and I think Representative um, oh. Gold, Goldman and, and Page and Houghton. So I have two questions. Um, first one is Medicare Part C, are those patients attributed? Are you concerned at all with the increase in um, enrollment in Part C? It's a, it's a, it is a, it's a great question. Uh, those we are seeing um, increase in enrollment in Part C. It's, uh, it's not astronomical. Um, Elena might want to talk more about it because the Green Mountain Care Board does does um, do some tracking of that. Um, but those those Medicare Advantage plans um, per um, our, our federal partners are, are not included. Yeah. Okay. Can, can, I just, can I just say, Elena, I, I have the same, same question uh, because I think, there, I think we, we can anticipate that there's going to be a greater uh, uh, penetration of Medicare Advantage plans uh, based on- Particularly with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont. Well, and-, right. and Starting and, theirs. And, and others. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not prepared today to, to quantify that, but it is something that we are, are looking at and it has kind of, we've seen an uptick and even, you know, in the, in the coming years. Um, so, and we are, you know, talking about it with our federal partners as well to understand kind of how they're thinking about, you know, these plans. Yeah. Uh, my other question was regarding number 14 on your recommended report. Um, making participation in blueprint contingent upon also participating in one care. Doesn't that seem a bit coercive? It's something, it's a longer term, um, it's a longer term recommendation and the recommendation is that it is something to explore. Uh, it's not necessarily, um, at this time, yes, one, one care is, it, it would be contingent on participation with one care uh, accountable care organization. Um, but we certainly think if our objective, it's worth exploring this. We do want stakeholder input. We aren't making this decision lightly. It's not happening uh, now, um, but it's worth exploring if our objective as a state is to move the system away from fee for service and to, and to um, and to have a value-based payment system for as a, as a statewide system, um, whether our blueprint program offerings are consistent with that objective. Uh, Representative Goldman, Representative Houghton, Representative Page. Um, the the, the uh, question came up um, of not-for-profit and for-profit yesterday or the day before, I don't know, they're all blending. Um, but I understand that One Care is considered a for-profit entity. And I think, I know we're gonna talk about that structure at some point, so I just wanna get that on the table, but I'm also wondering, would that um, sort of conversation include a legislative remedy or where that might so, be thought of um, yeah. if we it, it, thought that needed to happen? Yeah, let, let, me, let, me, let me speak to that uh, in the sense, that's, that's, that's set that, Let's come back to that. This is an issue that's raised uh, on numbers of occasions, and there's frankly great confusion and uh, about what that is, and uh, and the distinction we were making uh, in the other yesterday about for-profit and non-profit hospitals. It's a different. There's a there's different issues involved here, but I think I but we need to talk about it because it needs to be understood. Uh, so we will come back to that, absolutely. Representative Houghton, Representative Page. Uh, Ina, with this, all these recommendations, um, was there any type of agreement between the players who are responsible for achieving them on accountability of achieving them? 
you know, how, how are we holding everyone's feet to the fire, I guess? Um, we, that's a, that's a really good, that's a really good and fair question. Um, I, I believe that all of the players and certainly um, they, they can also speak for themselves are committed to improving in this model and that the uh, recommendations that we've made um, do align with known areas for improvement among these entities. The Green Mountain Care Board staff did um, provide consultation to us in, in creating the implementation improvement plan and, um, and, share, uh, and share thinking about how uh, improvements can be made. Um, we don't have a, a, a direct accountability mechanism that we built into, into the report um, for those partners who are not ourselves. We're certainly uh, holding our own feet to the fire to accomplish uh, these recommendations um, in the near, in near term in the medium term and in the longer term. Um, we have moved now the blueprint team uh, reports to me in the secretary's office. We've changed that reporting structure. Um, we are working with um, One Care on uh, looking at Care Navigator. Um, we've gotten right to work on these recommendations. And as you saw, some of them have been implemented successfully already, such as the Medicare risk corridor change which is in effect now um, as an example. But I think, you're, I think your question is, is uh, well taken and thank you. Representative Page. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I have a couple of critiques and, and it goes to some of the questions that have been asked before, um, particularly with uh, Chairman Lippert. Um, you, you mentioned that um, AHS is not stepping away from, from the agreement with One Care, but um, there does appear to be, um, there is an appearance that perhaps the Agency of Human Services and maybe the administration might be a little bit too close to One Care. And um, um, I'll just leave it at that. I realize that you have to work with that that organization, but it just, it just to me anyways, there, there is an appearance of maybe too, too much coziness. Um, the, other, the other critique is at looking at your, your um, strengthening some of your leadership strategies. Some of these things appear as so, why wouldn't you have done these things before? Um, they seem rather simple items, um, that should have been should have been uh, focused at the very at the very beginning of your relationship with the um, with one care, and I just like, for instance, transparency or providing useful additional information. I mean, those things to me seem very basic uh, quality uh, uh, management things that that should have been done, you know, from the very, from the very beginning. So those are just my two, my two um, critiques. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Peterson. And then I think we'll uh, see if there's any other questions for the witnesses. And then we will come back to this with committee discussion and also with the opportunity to hear from One Care itself, given that they been uh, the subject of a lot of uh, comment along the way. We, we, we need to hear from them and uh, as well. So Representative Peterson. Yes, uh, I'm glad I'm last uh, and I purposely didn't put my hand up till last. Um, Chairman Lippert, you spoke very eloquently to me when you talked about all payer, one payer and the average public doesn't know the difference. And I'm sitting here watching and hearing all of this today and yesterday. Um, it just, I, I'm a former football coach, so I have to around the Super Bowl, have to use the football analogy. This stuff is like somebody designing a complicated football play 
to a guy that's trying to get his shoulder pads on, right? I So my question will be a softball for this group of folks. I appreciate all you've said, but I, I'm just struggling to catch up, and I will. Uh, I read at night. I try to. I try to catch up. It just is is tough when you you're not in the field and haven't been here. Um, my question is, One Care is One Care the state insurance company? Is that what One Care is? It it is not. I'm seeing uh, no. Nina shake her head. What is One Care? I, I guess I'm. I want to start there. Um, and see how it compares to Blue Cross Blue Shield, MVP, Medicare, and Medicaid. I, I, I guess I just don't get, I wonder if there's a flow chart somewhere that shows a flow from one to the other so that, so that a person can see when somebody walks into that doctor's office, where does stuff go? So what is one care? I think Representative uh, Donahue may want to jump in here for a minute first. Well, well ju just to suggest that to step back slightly at one of the pieces we, I don't think we really look, explained yet is how did accountable care organizations come into being? Mm -hmm. What's their place in this? And then that'll help understand. Well, you can do it that way, but well, that, that'll leave explain acronyms out of it and just what is one care? That's what I right. want to know. Okay, and and our, you know, I appreciate I appreciate your uh, work to jump jump into something uh, that's incredibly complex uh, from from a baseline of not having worked in healthcare or done healthcare policy. I, I completely appreciate, and I actually appreciate your perspective that that helps us to re that requires us to really think more clearly so uh, well, i just think there's a lot of folks out there well 99.9 .9 of the folks yeah have no idea absolutely um, and, absolutely. and uh, you know i'm just trying to struggle through it so i i thought i would just get that piece and uh that's why i asked in the chat nolan may be listening to this i'm going to reach out to nolan he offered to get me oh i see yeah. and, and and try to learn that's all i want to do hi nolan <laughs> but I'll email you. But anyway. Okay. So, we, so give, given the time we have, I'm going to ask for, uh, uh, I'm going to turn to Ina, I guess. Uh, and you're going to get a less than full answer because it's not, it's not That's straightforward. Uh, and we will be coming back to this again and again. And, uh, but let's, Lena, feel free. And thank you, Art, for your question. Yep. When one care is not the state of Vermont. Um, one care is a private entity. And one care is a private entity that is made up of healthcare providers. It is a network of healthcare providers okay. that participate in, in and as part of, or that they make up one care Vermont. Um, the providers that participate in One Care Vermont include hospitals, it includes um, physician practices that are not affiliated with hospitals, it includes designated agencies, it includes home Those health, are the health agencies, just in terms of the designated agency jargon. Ment mental health and substance use disorder services providers and okay home health agencies too, um, are all participating in the network of providers um, that, that makes up One Care Vermont. One Care Vermont also has a, a, its team that administers its work, which is to provide its network with information and data um, and strategies to deliver care in a way that's more efficient and higher quality. Okay, and that is an ACO, as Representative Donahue pointed out. It's an ACO, and it is the only one we have right now. We that only have- That conglomeration of, okay. Yes. 
There was, a, there was a time when multiple ACOs were contemplated, but they did not materialize. Uh, and that's okay. you know, a piece of the history. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's fine. I will leave it there. That, that answers my basic question. That spawns yeah. eight, a thousand other questions, but that's fine. Yeah. But, uh, of course you yeah. do. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And, and can I take... Thank you very much, Gina. Thank you, Representative Peterson. And, I, and this is, it's useful that uh, Sarah Berry has been listening uh, from One Care. Uh, we will, and I made a note to myself, we need, those of us who are arranging agendas need to uh, be certain that we come back to uh, hearing from One Care and perhaps others uh, sooner rather than later so that we're able to benefit from the testimony we heard today and not uh, get diverted which we can easily into many other issues. Um, so we will do that, but this is useful, I think, for Sarah Berry and as a representative of One Care to have heard some of the questions that are being raised here today and uh, to emphasize the need to uh, have folks understand uh, both the role of One Care and the, uh, the role that One Care plays within this larger agreement that we're talking about, which which is in fact an agreement that is not contingent on one care. It's a contingent on an accountable care organization uh, existing and it happens to be one care, uh, but it's not a federal agreement with one care. I think that'd be fair to say. That, that's sometimes confusing as well. So we've covered a lot of ground here this morning and I appreciate everyone's participation genuinely. Uh, I wanna thank Ina and Elena both of you for your part in these presentations. I want to thank the committee members for raising questions, which, uh, and when I've on several occasions said, well, look, can we set that to the side and come back to it? Or we will talk about that more. This is, I, I'm not really intending to try to say, well, I don't want to talk about that. It's really a matter of trying to see how to facilitate us moving forward with the timeframes that we have. Uh, we will talk about every issue that committee members uh, have brought up. Um, but I think uh, given again our overarching goal of maintaining our own ability to function on Zoom as a legislature, uh, I think unless there's something else that I need to be reminded of, I think we're going to close our testimony and hearing this morning. Um, I'm, I'm trying hard to do that at by quarter 12 because some people have noontime meetings and at least give us a transition time off camera and uh, to deal with personal family. And because most of us are legislating from home. And again, I think we just, we cannot forget what we're, we're all doing this within the context of the pandemic. This, this is the reason, uh, I mean, this, that, 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 and when we talk about the healthcare providers and the healthcare system, I just want to underscore that our whole healthcare system is operating and laboring under the impact of this pandemic. Uh, and so that, and the pandemic is impacting all of, all of Vermonters in so many ways. And that that continues to be our primary focus as the legislature, as we try to move the state forward safely, successfully amidst this pandemic while trying to maintain initiatives that have been underway. So again, with a great deal of appreciation for every healthcare provider in the state of Vermont, thank you. Um, and we'll continue to try to find answers to all the questions we have as we move forward.